Shall we start? Yes. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the last computer seminar on computer architecture class. Um, yeah, was a hope you you like the topics that we covered during the semester. Today we have the last presentation as well. Uh, Adrian Tonic is going to talk about the PIM benchmark suite. Uh, is a paper that I also a co-author and is basically uh, investigation of the first commercially available processing memory uh, architecture called OpMem. And he's going to talk about our findings in that paper. And uh, and just to quickly introduce Adrian, he is a second year computer science student and is still looking for uh, his main interest is exploring uh, so far. So please join us in this talk and ask a bunch of questions. So thanks so much. Thank you for the introduction. So hello everyone, as mentioned before, this is our last presentation and I'm very excited to talk to you today about this interesting paper called Benchmarking a New Paradigm, an Experimental Analysis of Real Processing and Memory Architecture. Uh, these below are the authors, and this paper was published in the IEEE Access Journal at the beginning of 2022. Uh, where is it? So let's jump right in with the executive summary. Uh, the problem is that in current computing systems, data movement is a huge energy consumer and it always gets in the way of performance. Uh, the solution at hand is processing in memory, which is a promising paradigm that focuses on doing the computation where it most makes sense, that is where the data resides. Although not a new idea, technology challenges have prevented its successful materialization. And the up and dim modules have enabled the first commercial use of this technology being released in 2019. They use DDR4 chips with multiple embedded in order multi-threaded DRAM processing units or DPUs for short. The aim of this paper is to benchmark and characterize a system based around the up and dims and analyze its performance and energy consumption, as well as compare it to that of CPUs and GPUs of today. Uh, to that end, the authors use a suite of 16 benchmarks, which are known to be memory bound in conventional processor centric systems. They are open source, programmed in C, and have been tested on an interface which uses 20 of the new upmem memory sticks. Uh, as takeaways, we'll have the PIM suitability of different workloads, programming recommendations and suggestions, as well as hints for hardware and architecture designers of future PIM systems. Now, the outline of my paper is as follows. I will start with an overview and objectives, move on to some background information. Then I'll get into an in-depth analysis of the uh, piece of technology at the center of the presentation. Uh, then we'll look at the approach and results, the conclusions of the paper. And finally, I will give my own analysis of it with strengths, weaknesses. I'll shine the light of, on some of my own takeaways and we'll end with a discussion. Overview, uh, on, in the picture on the left here, you can see what the upmem sticks look like. And as you notice, they are not so different from traditional DDR4 chips. And on the right, you can see the system which was used for benchmarking with its two CPUs highlighted in blue. The PIM enabled memory sticks, 20 of them highlighted in yellow here. And in red, we have the DRAM sticks which still need to be present in the system. The objectives of the paper are to review how OpMem is built and what makes it different and intricate, analyze the performance of a PIM system on different types of widely used workloads today, and finally compare it, uh, its performance and energy consumption with CPUs and GPUs. Uh, now for some background information and further insights. If you look at a system on chip nowadays, you will find a lot of components such as CPU, GPU, cache, accelerators, and all of these need to communicate with each other and with the DRAM. And this means a lot of data movement, which is detrimental for the latency and performance of the system. Processor technology has developed much faster than memory technologies, resulting in this discrepancy in the time used to move data instead of compute, uh, do computations on it. And so data movement dominates performance as a major system energy bottleneck. 
if we look at the total system energy consumption, uh, data movement, depending on applications, uh, accounts for 62% in consumer applications, 40% in scientific applications, and 35% in mobile applications. Um, I have cited below the sources of these informations. A promising solution is PIM, which equips memory chips with processing capabilities and focuses on doing the computation as close to the data as possible. And if we look at how our computing systems work nowadays and what their problems are, we should focus on more data-centric systems in the future. There have, of course, been other proposed solutions, um, which are 3D stacked memory or processing using memory. But the traditional 2D type of memory of OpMem DIMMs have, has made them a lot more feasible and cheaper than the other technologies. Let's have a look at the insides of an OpMem DIMM module. The OpMem architecture consists of standard DIMM modules with memory arrays and a lot of PIM chips, which contain DRAM processing units or DPUs for short. Processing happens on the DRAM chips directly. And a major design challenge was encountered when making this product, which was that DRAM designs only use three metal layers, while conventional processors use more than 10, preventing the fabrication of fast logic transistors. But OpMem has overcome this challenge by using cores that are deeply pipelined and fine-grained multi-threaded. Also, OpMem DIMMs can be seen as a loosely coupled accelerator, similar in their way of doing computations to a GPU. This is how the system is organized, with a host CPU connected to some DRAM DIMMs, which represent the main memory, and some DRAM DIMMs, which represent the PIM-enabled memory. An OpMem DIMM contains eight or 16 chips, amounting to one or two ranks of eight chips each. This is the same picture as before, but this time with a more detailed look at the inside of a PIM chip. And inside each PIM chip, we find eight 64 megabyte MRAM banks, highlighted here with the DMA engine to the left to access them, and eight DRAM processing units or DPUs, resulting in a total of 64 DPUs per rank. Inside the PIM chip, we also find a DDR4 interface used for accessing the MRAM, a control status interface used by the host CPU to send commands to the DPU pipeline. And all of this is found eight times in a PIM chip from the 640 DPU system, and 16 times in a PIM chip from the 2,556 DPU system. Uh, we will take a look at both of these systems and their specifications in a few slides. Uh, now I'll talk about what type of processor the DPU is. It's a multi-threaded in-order 32-bit reduced instruction set computer with a specific ISA, uh, which is capable of running at up to 425 megahertz. In the paper, the authors ran it at 350 megahertz, and it's also presumed that in the future they will be able to run at 525. It has 24 hardware threads with 24 general purpose registers and a pipeline depth of 14 stages, but only the three last stages are parallelizable and capable of running in parallel with the fetch stages of the next instruction, which means that the DPU has a requirement of 11 cycles to fully utilize the pipeline and instructions are dispatched 11 cycles apart. The DPU functions alongside two SRAM-based memories 24 kilobytes of instruction RAM and 64 kilobytes of working RAM, which is a scratch pad type of memory, uh, which means that it's a software controlled cache and its bandwidth is independent of access pattern. Now let's take a look at the two systems mentioned before. First, we have a 2,560 DPU system. That is the theoretical maximum number of DPUs because um, in the system from the paper, there were actually only 2,556 because four of them were faulty. Uh, this system uses the maximum number of OpMem DIMMs, which is 20. Um, 16 chips um, are in the system and within each DIMM, there are 16 chips in this system, totaling to 40 ranks and 160 gigabytes of PIM capable memory. Uh, these are P21 DIMMs with a dual x86 socket. 
And in this system, up and dims coexist with regular DDR4 dims. Uh, secondly, there's a less powerful system with 640 DPUs. Uh, this has 10 upmem dims of eight chips each, so only 10 ranks instead of 40, and uh, 40 gigabytes of PIM enabled memory. Uh, the dims here are E19s with an x86 socket. I will now talk about the uh, methodology used by the authors in this paper and the results they arrived at as far as performance is concerned. I'll start with some specifics of the upmem architecture. And we will look at DPU arithmetic throughput, MRAM bandwidth, arithmetic throughput versus operational intensity, and CPU DPU communication. Uh, starting with the arithmetic throughput, the goal is to measure the maximum arithmetic throughput for different data types and operations. Uh, this is done with the help of micro benchmarks. Uh, the type of the micro benchmark is stream, which means uh, looping with a stride of one over the elements of an array in WRAM and performing read, modify, write operations on them. The experiments are done on one DPU with a number of tasklets varying between one and 24, which is the hardware maximum for a DPU. The arithmetic operations in question are add, subtract, multiply, and divide. And the data types are N32, N64, float, and double. Also worthy of mentioning is that the cycles are measured with an accurate cycle counter provided in the upmem SDK. So after the read, modify, write operations have been performed, this is the table where the, these are the tables where the results are being marked. On the y-axis, we have the arithmetic throughput in millions of operations per second, and on the x-axis, the number of tasklets. These are the results for addition and subtraction for N32. Uh, these are the ones for multiplication and division. And these are the results for the same operations for all of the other data types. Uh, now, as you can notice from this picture, not only are addition and subtraction way faster than multiplication and division, um, but processing done on N32s and N64s is an order of magnitude faster than that done on floats and doubles. And that is because floating point multiplication or division do not have native support, and they are instead emulated by a runtime library, which has hundreds of instructions and adds a lot to the latency. Also worthy of noticing here is that the throughput saturates at 11 tasklets, this is, as mentioned before, because of the way the pipeline is built, it takes 11 tasklets to saturate it. And also in the paper, the WRAM bandwidth is also measured, but I will not present that here. Uh, now, MRAM bandwidth. The goal here is to measure MRAM bandwidth for different access patterns. This is also done with the help of micro benchmarks. And the authors measure the latency of a single DMA transfer for different transfer sizes as well as see how the MRAM uh, performs with the stream benchmark, uh, which are the benchmarks from before, but also uh, with a new one this time, which is copy DMA, uh, which copies data from the MRAM to the working RAM of the DPUs, but without doing any loads or stores in the DPU core. Uh, there are results for strident and random access patterns available in the paper as well, uh, but I will not tackle those here. And the accesses to MRAM are included in the following results. First, for measuring uh, the latency of a DPU access, um, we uh, the authors developed a late, uh, linear expression, whereas uh, latency is written like this, where alpha is a constant that appears for every access. And other than that, the latency of the transfer depends on its size. Um, from that follows the equation for the bandwidth in bytes per second. The authors have experimentally measured beta in this equation to be 0 0.5 cycles per byte. And so the theoretical maximum MRAM bandwidth is 700 megabytes per second at 350 megahertz. Um, the results are not quite that, but they are within 90% of the theoretical limit. So what we see in the tables below does match the expectations from the theoretical equations. Uh, in this table, you can see the bandwidth 
and dark blue and the latency in light blue being shown in a logarithmic plot in relation to the data transfer size, ranging from eight bytes all the way up to 2048 bytes. Uh, the table on the left shows band the bandwidth for MRAM read and the one on the right for MRAM write. The observations are that the DPU's main memory or MRAM uh, bank access latency increases linearly with the transfer size and the maximum theoretical MRAM bandwidth is two bytes per cycle. Now for the stream benchmark MRAM bandwidth. In this table, you can see the sustained MRAM bandwidth on the y-axis, this time not on a logarithmic scale, and the number of tasklets on the x-axis. Uh, this is the bandwidth for the copy DMA, the new benchmark mentioned before. These are the results for copy and add, and these are the ones for scale and triad. Something different here compared to the results for arithmetic throughput is that we see saturation happening at less than uh, 11 tasklets. And that is because when the access latency to an MRAM bank for a streaming benchmark is larger than the pipeline latency, uh, the performance of the DPU saturates at less than 11 tasklets. Uh, this workload is memory bound one. And on the other hand, when the pipeline latency is greater than the MRAM access latency, the performance of the DPU saturates at 11 tasklets as expected and the workload is compute bound. So the dominant latency determines the bandwidth. Arithmetic throughput versus operational intensity of a DPU. This section aims to identify memory bound and compute bound regions for different data types and operations. The means of evaluation are load an array onto uh, WRAM from MRAM, perform a variable number of operations on it and store it back. This experiment is inspired by the roofline model, which is an analysis methodology that shows the performance of a program as a function of its arithmetic intensity. Operational intensity is defined here as the number of arithmetic operations performed per byte access from MRAM. Uh, worthy of mentioning as well is that pipeline latency changes with operational intensity, but MRAM access latency stays fixed. In this table, you can see the arithmetic throughput for integer addition on the y-axis. And on the x-axis, we have the operational intensity. In the memory bound region, which is the red one, uh, the arithmetic throughput increases with the operational intensity, whereas in the compute bound region, the arithmetic throughput is flat at its maximum. The throughput saturation point is the operational intensity where the transition between the memory bound region and the compute bound region happens, uh, which is here as low as one quarter operations per byte, which is one integer addition for every 32 bit element fetched. These are uh, results um, put in the same type of table uh, for the other operations and for the float data type as well. And in red, uh, I have marked the throughput saturation point. And the key observation here is that the DPU is fundamentally a compute bound processor since the arithmetic throughput saturates at such low operational intensity. And so most real world workloads are expected to be compute bound in the upm architecture. CPU, DPU, and DPU, CPU communication. Uh, CPU, DPU, and DPU, CPU transfers happen between the host CPU's main memory and the MRAM banks of the DPU. Uh, we're talking about three types of transfers, serial, parallel, and broadcast. Serial transfers are between the host CPU and the single DPU with one MRAM bank. Parallel transfers are to multiple DPUs with many MRAM banks. And broadcast is sending of a buffer to all of the DPUs. Um, now, inter-DPU communication is one of the problems of this architecture because the DPUs don't have a channel for communication amongst themselves, amongst themselves. So any data transfer happens via the host CPU using CPU, DPU, and DPU, CPU transfers. There are some more often encountered uh, typical communication patterns, which are merging of partial results to obtain the final result. 
Uh, these are DPU CPU type transfers only. And redistribution of intermediate results for further computation. These are both DPU CPU and CPU DPU. So a natural question which arises is, are those CPU DPU data transfers a bottleneck? Uh, the sustained bandwidth of all types of CPU DPU and DPU CPU transfers is also obtained with a micro benchmark, uh, which is done on one DPU first with a variable transfer size from eight bytes all the way up to 32 megabytes. And then on one rank, which is 64 DPUs, with a fixed transfer size of 32 megabytes to or from a set of one to 64 MRAM banks within the same rank. Not more than one rank is used since preliminary experiments have shown that the UPM SDK only parallelizes transfers within the same rank. These are the results for one DPU. On the y-axis, you can see the sustained CPU DPU bandwidth on a logarithmic scale. And on the x-axis, we have the data transfer size in bytes from eight all the way up to 32 megabytes. And light blue is the bandwidth for CPU, DPU, and dark blue is DPU, CPU. The takeaway is that larger CPU, DPU, and DPU, CPU transfers between the host memory and the MRAM banks results in higher sustained bandwidth. These are the results for one rank. And the difference, the main difference compared to the table from before is that this time the transfer size is fixed and it, there is a varied number of DPUs from one all the way up to 64. Uh, the full shapes here represent the serial transfers for both CPU, DPU and DPU, CPU. Uh, the hollow ones are the parallel transfers and the red triangles uh, is the bandwidth for, represents the bandwidth for the broadcast transfers. The sustained bandwidth of parallel CPU, DPU and DPU, CPU transfers between the host main memory and MRAM banks increases with the number of DPUs inside the rank. Now let's take a look at the prim benchmarks, which are one of the most important parts of this paper. Uh, prim is a suite of workloads designed to test how the two upmem systems, the 2,556 DPU and 640 DPU one perform, and for identifying weaker areas of them. They are also meant to compare software improvements and compilers and compare future PIM systems. The selection criteria for, the, for these benchmarks are that the workloads uh, have to be from different application domains, and they are all workloads which are memory bound on processor centric systems. There are 14 different workloads and 16 benchmarks in total. Uh, these are all the benchmarks with their application domains, such as graph processing, neural networks, image processing, dense and sparse linear algebra or databases. And on the rightmost column, there's a short name for identifying each of them. And all of those benchmarks are in the memory bound region of the roofline model. The prim benchmarks are also diverse in that they have memory access patterns, which are different. They have different operations and data types and different communication and synchronization. Uh, let's now have a look at uh, what I would say is the simplest prim benchmark, which is vector addition. Uh, this one takes two vectors A and B and performs their element wise addition. Uh, it does that by assigning chunks of the arrays to the DPUs and again inside each DPU, partitioning that data between tasklets, which are software threads running on a DPU. At the end of the execution on the DPUs, the CPU retrieves the output vector chunks from the MRAM banks to the host main memory and constructs the complete output vector. Uh, this is the evaluation methodology for the prim benchmarks. They are tested on the two systems and strong and weak scaling experiments on the 2,556 DPU system are done on one DPU, one rank, and up to 32 ranks. Strong scaling is similar to Amdom's law in that it refers to the variation of execution time of a program which solves a specific problem when we increase the number of processors, but the problem size stays fixed. Whereas weak scaling is similar to Gustafsson's law 
uh, because it again refers to the variation in execution time uh, when varying the number of processors, but this time the problem size stays fixed per processor. Uh, the paper includes a comparison of the upman based PIM systems to state-of-the-art CPUs and GPUs, which are the Intel Xeon E3-1240 CPU and the NVIDIA Titan 5 GPU. Uh, I also want to mention that strong scaling results on one rank, 32 ranks, as well as weak scaling results are not presented here, but they are available in the paper. Uh, these are the results for strong scaling on one DPU. The number of tasklets for each benchmark is set from one all the way up to 16. And this is the breakdown of execution time. Uh, the benchmark here is vector addition. Uh, this is the time taken up by the execution on the DPU. Uh, there's also inter-DPU time um, taken into account here, but since vector addition doesn't have any inter-DPU communication, it's not visible for this benchmark. This is the time for CPU-DPU transfers. This is the one for DPU-CPU transfers. And in red, here is the speed up for one tasklet. Uh, most of the benchmarks the, have the best performing number of tasklets at 16. And speed ups from 1.5 all the way up to two times are encountered as the number of tasklets doubles from one to eight. And a lower speed up of only up to 1.5 times from eight to 16, since the pipeline throughput saturates at 11 tasklets only. The key observation is that the number of tasklets greater than 11 is a good choice for most real world workloads tested as it fully utilizes the DPU's pipeline. Now regarding the synchronization, uh, the benchmarks highlighted in green do not use any intra-DPU synchronization primitives. Uh, the ones highlighted in light blue use only lightweight synchronization and BFS, histogram and transpose use mutexes, which causes contention when accessing shared data structures. Now, what does this mean for the breakdown of execution time? It means that for some benchmarks, the speed up uh, goes down after, 11, after eight tasklets. That is because intensive use of intra-DPU synchronization across tasklets, such as mutexes, barriers, or handshakes may limit scalability sometimes causing the best performing number of tasklets to be less than 11. Now let's see the performance comparison between CPU, GPU, and the upmem system. In this table on the y-axis, we have speed up over the CPU in the logarithmic scale. And the table is divided into two columns, um, more PIM suitable workloads and less PIM suitable workloads. These are the more prim suitable workloads and these are the less prim suitable workloads. And as you notice, PIM systems outperform the CPU for all benchmarks except SPMV, BFS, and Needleman Wunsch. And the 2,556 DPU and 640 DPU systems are respectively 93 times and 27.9 times faster than the CPU for 13 of the prim benchmarks. The 2,556 DPU system outperforms the GPU for 10 benchmarks with an average of 2.54 times. And the performance of the 640 DPU, uh, a bit lower, but still within 65% of the performance of the GPU for the same 10 prim benchmarks. Now for the energy comparison, the 640 DPU system consumes on average 1.64 times less energy than the CPU for all 16 prim benchmarks because of the less time it takes to run the benchmarks on it. And for 12 benchmarks, the 640 DPU system provides energy savings of 5.23 times over the CPU. Uh, we have arrived at the conclusions now. There are four key takeaways. First one of which is the upmem PIM architecture is fundamentally compute bound. And as a result, the most suitable workloads are memory bound. The most well-suited workloads for the upmem PIM architecture use no arithmetic operations or use only simple operations because of the native support that they have in the system. 
the most well-suited workloads for the AppMemp architecture require little or no communication across DPUs or inter-DPU communication. And the fourth takeaway, AppMemp-based PIM systems outperform both state-of-the-art CPUs and GPUs on most PIM benchmarks. And the outlook is even more positive for future PIM systems. AppMemp-based PIM systems are also more energy efficient than state-of-the-art CPUs and GPUs on workloads that they provide performance improvements over. Now, before I move on to my own analysis, are there any questions? Okay, then I'll go on. Uh, these are the strengths I have found of the paper. First of all, there is uh, concise background information with a clearly outlined difference between processing near memory, processing using memory, and processing in memory, which are all slightly different paradigms. And there's a thorough explanation of the process followed to evaluate the Upman PIM architecture, and each benchmark in the PRIM suit is well presented. Um, the paper also shows meticulous and in-depth analysis of MRAM bandwidth, CPU, DPU transfers, arithmetic throughputs, energy and performance comparisons, and programming recommendations. The open source benchmarks provided can also be used for other applications. And I believe that the paper is really well structured, well depicted with information field graphs and tables. Uh, the weaknesses now, they are far less than the strengths. Uh, first of all, there is no energy consumption comparison available for the 2,556 TPU system. Uh, but that is because at the, type of, at the time of writing the paper, uh, it was not possible to measure that because um, those DIMMs did not have um, energy consumption measurement enabled. Also, it can be easy to get lost in the details with so many benchmarks and things which are being evaluated. And the paper is a bit of a long read, but fortunately, Safari provides presentations of various lengths on it, from five minutes to more than two hours, depending on the level of detail you prefer. Now for my takeaways. Memory is an area of computer architecture that still requires a lot of work and efforts being put into it. And memory technologies can make a huge difference, not only in terms of performance, but also in terms of energy, uh, which has a huge impact on all systems nowadays. That is not to say that performance is not important. And about PIM, uh, processing in memory brings speed especially for real-time processing, scalability, because the memory is no longer such a big bottleneck as in the systems we have now, and energy efficiency. If you'd like to add any strengths or weaknesses before we move on to the discussion. So uh, what weaknesses, what weakness comes to mind when analyzing the upm architecture? What would be it, one of its problems? Yep. Um, one thing I think could be possible is because it's still in early stage that it might be a little bit general and maybe in the future people would specialize it more depending on the application. Yeah, exactly. 
So that's exactly what I had thought of. That is a general purpose architecture. Um, first of all, and I have uh, found two more main weaknesses. If anybody would want to add to it. And it's just actually a question. Uh, why is being it being a general purpose architecture a weakness in your mind? Well, it's, it can also be an advantage, but since it's so general purpose, it performs poorly on many benchmarks. For example, in graph processing, mainly that's where it does the worst. So maybe there's no need to focus on that area at all, so make it more specialized. So uh, more thinking about like uh, PIM accelerators kind of thing, like special purpose accelerator for... Yeah, exactly. For, but uh, then you would, wouldn't you make a, like a special purpose system just for that if you actually really only need graph processing? And we've seen the, I think it was the Tesseract paper, I think, which was about uh, like graph processing. I hope, I, I don't know, the, I don't remember. Um, so then, I mean, sometimes, I mean, most systems need general purpose, right? Um, that's true, but the upmem dims, I would say, are a lot cheaper than other accelerators. I, I don't know the exact numbers, but it might be easier to have some PIM accelerators rather than build a whole new architecture for a, a workload. Okay. So the two other weaknesses which I found are inter-DPU communication, which is what's most detrimental for graph processing, and the lack of flexibility or diversity of systems that can be built using optim dims. And let's start with what I mean by general purpose architecture. <laughs> so in 2022, UpMem is no longer the only PIM technology available. There are prototypes from other companies. Maybe you can name a few. I think, I think Samsung has one. Yep. Uh, Samsung has HPM PIM. And there is also the SK Hynix accelerator in memory. And what these do differently is that they are specialized on high performance computing, neural networks, and big data. So the idea is make upmem dims more specialized as well. And as I said before, this regards solar performing workloads altogether, such as sparse matrix vector or BFS. And inter-DPU communication is a bottleneck, but maybe it doesn't need to be solved at all. We could only use stream type workloads. Now, inter-DPU communication is a weakness. Um, does someone have any ideas as to how that might be fixed? This is the possible solution from before. So right now the inter DPU communication is done first by the CPU, right? Uh, yes. So what's happening? Well, then uh, is uh, somehow putting all these uh, chips on 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 the same interconnect my ISA and have pass links between them rather than have to go by the CPU? Uh, yes, yes, I think that would be a good idea. Uh, what I've thought about is leveraging new in DRAM data copy techniques or providing better connectivity inside of DRAM, which is what you said. And I've cited below some papers which talk about ways to do this. Also, could coordination between upmem dims and GPU 
speed up things even more and cover a wider range of applications? Could we make the two work together? Yeah, I think maybe I'm mistaken, but I, there was a paper on this. I think I'm cheating a bit because I think I saw a paper on this. Bit, like, it's like efficient. Might be, I don't remember exactly the title. Is this what you what you had in mind? I actually don't know the paper. No? Uh, I would, I would say that yeah, it was definitely be even faster because now we would have two separate accelerators in the system, the GPU and the upmem DIMMs as well. Um, they're maybe not really comparable because GPUs have been developed for way longer, but they can still cooperate. And now I'll talk about what I mean by a lack of flexibility uh, for systems that can be built using upmem DIMMs. So the upmem dims have a huge potential, and the system used in the paper is not much larger than a traditional desktop computer. So in fact, it's pretty similar to that. So we have a system which is similar to what we have now. What could we do differently? Could we maybe use it in other types of systems as well? Yes. I mean, it goes back to the first point, I think, because uh, we said it's a very general purpose architecture. So mainly you're not going to use this in extremely, like you're not going to use this to accelerate like graph processing at Facebook or anything like that. You're going to probably either put it like desktop computer is a perfect place for them, but also maybe um, just general purpose servers the kind of things like uh, Amazon E3 or something like that, uh, yeah. that you can just like general purpose. Like if you can accelerate a lot of workloads on gen like general purpose, like a lot of workloads, then it's, it makes sense to put it on servers as well. Yep, in a cloud environment, for example. Yeah. And I thought that we can also make memory that works with the same principles, but on, smaller devices also, such as laptops or maybe even phones, or make the DIMMs even denser and use even more of them to support bigger workloads and add to the performance, such as in servers. And my final question to you is, how long do you think it will take until PIM technology like this will be available mostly everywhere? Um, sorry, just on the previous point, make PIM denser, uh, DIMMs de even denser. Wasn't there like a fundamental manufacturing limits to making, like to have, you know, better DIMMs? Because um, you, you, you like, encode, like the substrate is a RAM, a DRAM or it's yeah. not the same technology node as a CPU or something like that. Yeah, there was a problem regarding the metal layers. But I believe that as long as you keep the same principle of multi-threading it, multi-threading the DPUs, I think you can cram even more of them on the DIMMs. And I don't think that should be a problem. Are there any answers to the final question maybe? Yeah. Okay, so I'm guessing that um, it's all a matter of cost. It's going to be in devices if it's cheap enough, because either people have a high enough um, reason, a big enough reason to use them, and that's usually only in very special 
accelerators kind of thing, or it's cheap enough and it accelerates everything. And so you, you get it. So it's just a matter of, matter of time, um, matter of cost going down, I guess, maybe. Yeah, I left this as more of an open-ended question. I, I agree with you. <laughs> So if nobody has any other questions, this was it for my presentation. Thank you for listening and a special thanks to my mentors. Very good, Adrian. Thank you very much. Can you, can you guys hear me? I hope you can hear me. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah. Um, again, thank you very much for the presentation. It was a great talk. I think the analysis of the strengths and weaknesses was also uh, pretty good, and uh, and also the discussion points. I would like to uh, say a couple of things about the discussion points. Uh, I think those are uh, really good questions, and 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 these are and, and they are questions to keep thinking about them. For example, the uh, specialization or not. Is uh, good to be general purpose or is not good to be general purpose? If you compare the admin system to the other prototypes, uh, admin is more general purpose, even though it's um, specialized as well because it only natively supports uh, integer uh, computations and not floating point computations. So that's uh, in, in some sense, a little bit of a specialization there. I think that the key difference is that uh, the other vendors like Samsung or SK Hynix, they are really pushing for a specific applications that are important these days, such as machine learning or artificial intelligence. That's clear. Um, and in that sense, it, uh, it, they are probably doing the right thing for their, their goals and their purposes. I think that the admin effort is uh, extremely interesting as well because it allows us to study what other workloads can be good or can, be, can benefit from processing in memory without specializing so much. Um, of course, I agree with Adrian uh, that um, there are certain workloads that don't perform so well and uh, there could be ways of improving the admin system for these workloads. Uh, Adrian has mentioned works like Roclon, Lisa, or Figaro that are ways of communicating inside a DRAM chip, communicate it, and, and that would be a possible way for internal uh, inter-DPU communication that would definitely alleviate the overhead of inter-DPU communication through the host that the current system has. And I don't think that's, that's so difficult, uh, and of course not impossible to implement. So um, I firmly believe that this system has a strong potential and um, it can for sure uh, keep improving. You guys have also mentioned the uh, possible synergy between admin beams and GPUs. That's uh, something that could definitely happen and, 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 and for sure something interesting to explore. Um, uh, and, 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 and indeed, it's uh, happening as well. Uh, Samsung and SK Hynix proposals are mostly uh, intended to complement uh, GPUs. And very recently, for example, Hans Samsung has announced um, a collaboration with AMD to integrate HVM in um, uh, stacks, which are the, uh, one of the prototypes from Samsung with AMD GPUs. And, these supposedly will be launched sometime soon. I don't know exactly when, if it's going to be next year or the year after, but it's something that they announced like a, two, a couple of weeks ago. So um, for sure, uh, there, there are going to be synergies between CPU, GPUs and, and processing in memory, which is in reality a very common trend these days, making processing I mean, making compute systems more and more heterogeneous and specialize different parts of the processing system, the compute system to different parts of the workloads. So um, that's, uh, it's, it's happening for sure. Now, when are we really, the last question, right? When are we really going to see uh, real world processing in memory systems in or laptops or servers or even uh, cell phones? That's something that, 
um, it's uh, unsure yet. We don't know when that's going to happen, but it's pretty likely that we'll, uh, we will see them in the near future. And the key reason is that um, it's not only uh, our work, this paper in particular, but also other papers from, uh, from our group, uh, from many other uh, groups in academia, and also all these um, efforts in the, industri in the industry that are showing that there are really um, a strong potential uh, from uh, leveraging processing in memory in real systems. So um, I believe it's, um, it's something that is going to happen sooner than later. Um, that's basically it, I guess, uh, that I wanted to say. Um, there is one more thing that I would like to say is recommend you, if you guys are interested in taking a look at the study that um, we did as well of uh, machine learning workloads, uh, training of machine learning workloads uh, on the admin pin system. Um, it, uh, even though it might, the admin pin system might not be targeted at um, deep learning, such as the HPMP or SK Hynix proposals, but uh, other machine learning algorithms can definitely benefit uh, from from this uh, admin system, we have shown very good uh, performance improvements with respect to CPU and GPU for uh, algorithms like decision tree or k-means, and um, and 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 a system, a team system like AppMem has the advantage that the compute power increases with the memory capacity. So if you have a very large memory where you can feed your entire um, training data set, um, you can operate very efficiently on, uh, on it. Um, and that's, and that's uh, actually pretty good. And it, and it definitely uh, overcomes the, the overhead of uh, having to synchronize DBUs, et cetera, et cetera, because the main bottleneck is, I mean, the main overhead would be to uh, transfer the training data set to the up endings but once you have done that, um, you don't have to move it anymore. So after many, many iterations in a training algorithm, in a, in a, in a training process, um, the, the cost of this initial data movement is completely amortized. You can take a look at the, at the um, uh, paper that uh, we have uh, published in, in archive uh, quite recently. So that's um, all from my side. I don't know if uh, Mohammed or someone else uh, wants to add something. Um, I, I would just like to say that I hope you guys enjoyed this course, this seminar. Um, if you are interested in any of the topics or more interested in any of the topics that we cover in the course, please don't hesitate to contact us. And in particular, if you are interested in working on processing in memory or with this uh, admin P system, uh, please uh, contact me, Geraldo or other people working in processing in memory. We will we'll be glad to have a discussion with you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. That was a great one. Uh, so, Geraldo, would you like to comment on this topic? On the whole topic of processing memory? Yes. I can, I can talk <laughs> for like literally five years. Yeah, I know you love this topic. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think overall, uh, I think you like you guys liked about covering. It covers every process memory papers in the seminar. It was mentioned here also Tesseract paper. There are many, many more. Uh, I think it's a really interesting time to work on process memory, especially because now, after many years, I started working in process memory in 2017, and at that time, wasn't even certain if would make it would eventually make it in the market or not. And right now, you start actually seeing such architectures uh, being manufactured and being being developed by ma major. Uh, players in the market like Samsung. Uh, here I was mentioned Samsung and and the, I forgot the other one. Anyway, is the is the GDR6 one? Uh, SK Hynix. SK Hynix one, and then there is also Alibaba, and then uh, other uh, startups working on processing memory. So it's a really nice time to actually push and solve the big problems that needs to be solved related to processing memory. This whole discussion about generability or general purpose of accelerators or processing memory is a great 
discussion because it brings different challenges and it impacts how you design the system. And, and each one of them can lead to, to, to different uh, solutions, which right now we are seeing that both exist, uh, and both have a uh, space in the markets to, to coexist. So it's, it's, it's really nice. Uh, so hope you guys learned, liked about the topic. And it's, it's really cool uh, because uh, now that I'm about to graduate in, I don't know, one or two years, I can get a job. So it's really, uh, it's really interesting for me as well. So yeah, I hope you guys enjoy it. So I guess that is the end of the class, uh, the end of the semester as well. Uh, soon the quiz is going to be available online. And, and if you guys have any uh, question or want to work on us related to any of the topics that was mentioned during the semester, please feel free to email the head TAs or one of the PhD students will be glad to talk to you guys. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Mohammed, is there anything else? Yeah, great, Geraldo. So if any of the companies have any opening to Geraldo, you know how to reach him. So please, please contact me with a really good offer. <laughs> yeah, you can negotiate the salary, basically. All right, Adrian, that was great. Uh, so uh, I sent you more information about the last task for this course. So probably you'll receive the email in 10 minutes or so. There is a 30 minutes delay. Um, that is the end of the course. So thank you everyone. Uh, we will ask you for the synthesis report within a month or so, basically, but you will receive more information about the deadline. So we will ask you to summarize your experience with this course. What are the things that you have learned? if you have any research ideas out of the papers that were presented, and if you would like to do research with us in any of the topics presented in this course or the things that you are interested in. So that is the end of uh, this course. Uh, hopefully you'll have uh, healthy, safe trips over the holidays and enjoy it. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Happy holidays. <laughs>